All right, so hopefully everyone can still hear me. Um, so uh, as I said, here this is uh, going to be a presentation on interpretive plans and the interpretive planning process and how it can work with the grant program. Um, I'm the, my name is Todd Mahan. I'm the State History Services Manager. Um, I'm one of the content reviewers in the grant program, and I primarily look at these interpretive projects, which include interpretation, interpretive plans, um, but also the products that come out of those. And I'll just really briefly cover those types of things towards the end. But that's those are things like uh, um, exhibits, and it could be publications or historical markers or walking tours or whatever it is that the um, interpretive plan process sort of guides you towards. Generally, those are all going to be eligible um, things to apply for to implement that uh, that in that interpretation, and we can also do the research and writing of those things as well. And I'll get into those a little bit further. Um, but here's my contact information, um, and uh, um, that will be at the final slide as well. But um, all of us in the Heritage Preservation Department that work on grants. Uh, we are very good at sharing um, and uh, being approachable. As somebody who used to apply for grants to this program, um, I always found the staff willing to answer a lot of my questions, and I think we continue that today. So um, if you don't find what you um, want in this presentation, feel free to get a hold of me um, and, uh, and then um, any, or anyone else in the Heritage Preservation Department here. So here's uh, really briefly what I want to cover today. I'm hoping that this will take about a half hour um, although I didn't um, really practice this, so maybe it'll take 10 minutes, maybe it'll take an hour and a half now. I'm thinking it'll be about a half hour or so here. Um, and so we're gonna cover what is an interpretive plan. We're gonna talk about the process of how an interpretive plan is created. And then we're gonna also get into how, um, how to apply for um, a grant, not the nuts and bolts per se, but what parts of the application how you, what you should be considering when you're asking for an interpretive plan. And then I've got a slide just for some additional resources on, on interpretive planning, and then we'll um, hopefully have some questions and answer session at the end as well. So I'd also like to just encourage you in the chat feature as well, just to go ahead and, um, if you don't even have a question, to go ahead and just introduce yourself. Um, it's helpful for us to know what, uh, in sort of what you're hoping to get out of this, it's helpful for us to see um, what type of organizations are out there looking for focus on the message that's the that's the development of that uh, that um, theme and the sub themes but also understand the mechanics in the media and the media is just another uh, term for um, you know the products of the exhibit so the media might be a book it might be an exhibit and um, and within the exhibit it might be the specific things of the objects that are on exhibits or AB um, uh, um, digital content or things like that uh, interactive um, content. So the National Association for Interpretation has these 13 benchmarks that they say are components for an interpretive plan. Um, and so I've, I'm not going to read these off to you, um, but I've sort of uh, bolded two and three, which is about that work of connecting with the audiences that are going, that are the targets of the interpretation, the people that you want the message to come to. And so it's audience analysis and civic engagement. And audience analysis is the understanding that is critical to the success of the, of the plan. And the civic engagement is the successful interpretive plans usually include stakeholder involvement and or public input. So I'm just gonna kind of, um, go through like what are the what the National Association for Interpretation has as its as its um, good, better and best practices for these two um, benchmarks in an interpretive plan. So for audience analysis, at a minimum, you're going to want to use focus groups, surveys, civic engagement and direct observation or other methods as appropriate to assess audience needs and preferences. And you're going to want to consider audience needs and preferences in the planning process. So that's the minimum. That's good practice. And then they've got these guidelines that would um, so, uh, to additional things that you want for better practice and best practice. So for better practice, you're going to collect and analyze visitor perception of resources and programming through informal discussion and observations of staff. Use information about visitors regularly collected by staff on data sheets and as questions asked where people are from and why people are coming to the organization and use staff reports and other method to collect visitor data and prepare annual trend reports that can be used in planning. So this is, you want to, this is the idea of like, um, that this audience analysis isn't something that is done on a one-time basis and you just sort of assume that the audience is static. 
once you begin the process, you're going to want to sort of keep going back to the audience and seeing if they've um, if they've changed, if their needs have changed, or if, or if uh, the content subsequently needs to be changed for those things. And then the best practice, um, if you're hiring an outside source, is to assign an or to assign an in-house team, and every five years to do an analysis of visitation trends and the implications of interpretation. So these are the things that you want to um, really focus on in your planning for audience analysis. Um, next for the civic engagement, uh, good practice, the minimum is for that you're gonna want that the interpretive plan process is gonna include a, at least one civic engagement opportunity. And I would definitely encourage more than one. Obviously, um, that's the minimum with a good practice. And a better practice is that interpretive plan process includes one or more opportunities for key stakeholders and audiences to have input and to review the plan document. And then the best practice is that uh, the drafts and final interpretive master plan are available to the stakeholders through varied means. So the people that were part of the process get a chance to see what the final product was. And again, like there's a lot of ways to do these um, civic engagement opportunities or you, know, you can call them a lot of things. I mean, focus groups or community conversations. And I think those moderated um, focus groups and community conversations are really a lot of the best ways to do this. And a talented moderator can really um, get a group, can sort of tease out the ideas of what do they want in the interpretation and what do they find that's important to the community that they want to learn more about. And so those are the things that can come out in that process. So if you want to apply to our grant program for um, an interpretive plan, um, there's uh, our grants admin staff can definitely fill you in more on the process. I'm not going to take you through how to set up an account or any of that. Well, you can go to the grants webpage, um, which is uh, at, uh, you can see it there, mnhs.org backslash preservation backslash legacy dash grants. Also, if you just go to mnhs.org, you can see, um, you can see the, uh, um, this orange preservation tab. And once you open that up, you can um, find legacy grants. And so this stuff here in the red will um, help you, that is circled in the red, is where you can um, find out how to uh, set up an account in our grants portal. Um, the grants manual, um, which is a very important thing. The grants manual is something that um, is, uh, I would um, advise anybody that's even thinking about applying for a grant to take a look at the grants manual. Um, our grant program can fund a lot of things, so it's a very large grant manual that can that has information about how to do historic preservation projects and and uh, collections conservation projects and collections management and then interpretive projects, and so that sort of tries to fit into all of it. And so you can download the PDF and say, "Oh my lord, it's 150 pages." Really, the first um, 30 to 40 pages are focusing on on getting your application together, uh, getting your uh, um, your account set up and things like that and, and general things that are applicable to all the grants about hiring and procurement. But then you're just going to want to look for the essentially the chapter that's on on um, your project. And so for uh, interpretation, there are there's an interpretive programs section of the manual so you can find that. So I would definitely encourage everyone to to check that part out of out as well. Okay. So when you are going through, like uh, the application is is the same for no matter what type of project you're uh, applying for, and so they have all got a section for the budget, the project description, the need and rationale, project personnel, work plan and timetable, and sustainability. And so when you are working on the budget, acceptable um, line items for the budget would include the cost of a planner if you're hiring. Uh, in a, uh, a planning firm, an interpretive firm for this, their costs, um, costs for meetings, rental of um, facilities, um, things like that. That's an appropriate uh, thing. Um, printing costs, um, possibly honorariums, um, if there are people that you um, feel like uh, you need to provide an honorarium for them to be there, which can be a very important thing to get um, some underrepresented communities at uh, these things. So. Those are all appropriate things that you could include in your budget. Basically, the budget should is um, everything that you want the grant project to pay for. That should be in your budget. The project description is, um, you know, what are the components of the final product? So you're going to want to describe what you want to accomplish with the plan, but you're also going to talk about all of these things pro are projects that have products. And so the final product for this is 
the interpretive plan. And so in the project description area, you're gonna to wanna to describe the components that you want in that in the in the interpretive plan, and so those are the things we can. I'll just really quickly bounce back. So those are um, these types of things. So tell us that uh, that you're going to develop interpretive themes and sub themes um, that you're going to uh, you know do an inventory of the historic resources and, and those things, and then also you're going to want to describe well what is the process that we're going to go through to plan it. We're going to um, do surveys. We're going to do we're going to do three focus groups. Um, one with community elders, one with uh, K through 12 or fifth grade school um, teachers or whatever, describe um, what these uh, groups are and who they are and um, when you're gonna meet with them. And then you're also gonna wanna make sure that you confirm with us like, that you're gonna follow standards. And so we use the National Association for Interpretation um, for the standards for interpretive plans. And so you're gonna wanna confirm that that's what you work on. For the need and rationale, I always describe this as um, this section, regardless of what you're applying for, is why this project and why now? And so if you are coming to us for an interpretive plan, um, it might there's a lot of good reasons to be doing an interpretive plan. Um, you maybe have moved into a new building or you're moving into a new building, and so that's going to change the way that you're telling the stories. Maybe there's a community anniversary coming up. It's the um, county sesquicentennial, or in 2026, we've got the the US 250, the um, Hester Centennial, I think it's called, or the, um, uh, the no, excuse me, the semi quincentennial. So you can write that down. Um, so it could be things like that, or if you've gone through with your organization a um, strategic planning process and that in the work plan you've identified that there is um, a need to develop a interpretive plan. Those are all great things to include in the need and rationale. It says that this is why you're doing it and this is why it's the time to do it and also demonstrates that that you've put some thought and planning into it and that this isn't just sort of a um, kind of a, a, fan, a flight of fancy or anything like that. Project personnel, this depends on, um, you know, if you're gonna be hiring a firm, which is a very common thing um, for grant app, grantees and grant applicants to ask for. Um, so the firm, and so you would identify the firm that you're gonna um, hire for it. Or if you're gonna hire the, um, the firm or any of the project personnel afterwards, um, which is something that's up to you. You can do. You can hire before you're applying, or you can hire after. The work cannot begin until after the grant is done, but um, you can do that before or after. You just have to um, follow our procurement process, which is something that our grants admin staff can can um, help you with um, in more detail. Uh, but in the project personnel, you're going to want to describe who is hired and what their skill set is, or if you haven't hired them yet. Um, talk about the skill set that you're looking for. And so a great thing to include with that, if you haven't hired yet, is to include the RFP, the re request for proposal, um, or the or a draft of a, uh, or of a job posting um, and, and job description for um, the project personnel part. And so the work plan and timetable, that is um, where you can describe um, parts of the project description and put some more detail of when it's gonna happen. So when are the public input sessions going to be what's the schedule for this and I think the best way to do this is to just sort of say week one to week three we're going to um, go through the process of hiring the firm or whatever or we're going to have our first meeting meetings with the firm where they're going to talk to us about expectations and things like that and then in week six is um, uh, meeting number one week seven is meeting number two etc and then and at week eight or ten or whatever the schedule is is when you know initial drafts will be um, given from the from the uh the contractor to the organization um, and time for feedback on that. So that's the type of things that we look for in the work plan and timetable. Essentially what this does is it shows to us like how reasonable that you are being with this. And so we can accept, assess the quality of the, of the plan that you have for, um, for the application, for the project that you're applying for. And then there's sustainability. And then I would use that section to describe the organization's plan to implement the recommendations of the plan. Uh, so, this, as we've described, and you've hopefully come to understand, the interpretive plan is a series of recommendations that come out of this process of working with the community and understanding the resources of the museum to uh, come up with um, suggestions or uh, priorities for ways to tell these stories based on the themes that are developed. And so in this section, you want to describe to us um, what, how you feel you can carry out that work. 
and you can certainly describe that you would intend to come back to the grant program for um, for uh, applications to um, to do implement the recommendations of that, and that's generally something that we would um, be very interested in. So you might sort of be asking yourself, well, where does this fit into all of this? And the interpretive plan is really kind of the, at the beginning of, uh, well, not kind of, it's, it is at the beginning of the interpretive process. And so we've got this diagram here that talks about how you can at first apply for the interpretive plan. And then, so the green is the applications and then the blue is, is um, doing the, the work of, of a funded project. So that's the developing of the interpretive plan. So after you've identified the sub themes and, and, you've, and it says that you wanna do exhibits with it, um, then you might sort of say, okay, so if it's you know back to that Minnesota River um, uh, example that I um, had earlier, you might say, well, we know generally the stories, we've got the themes that we know, but we realize that you know we don't know enough about uh, um, the Dakota um, on the Minnesota River, or we don't know enough about farm technology, and so we need to do some research on that. So it's perfectly reasonable and acceptable to to apply for research and um, we can definitely in down the line um, talk about, do webinars about um, how research projects can work with the grant program. But that's definitely something that you can talk to me about. Um, John Fulton in our um, grants office also does a lot of work with, uh, with some of the research um, applications as well. So we can describe that process. And then you can also use the grant program to actually write the content. So if it's an exhibit to write the exhibit script and to do an exhibit plan, which would um, select the objects for uh, for using the um, the themes that are from the interpretive plan. So that's acceptable. And then you can also come to us to actually what we describe as implementing the interpretation. So building the exhibit um, and uh, installing it. If you're doing historical markers, um, building, uh, fabricating the markers and installing them. If it's a book that you're doing, uh, publishing it. Uh, you'll see this big bright red line here and you might wonder, well, what's that there for, Todd? Well, <laughs> that's there because these things on the front end, you can apply if you want to um, in, a, in one grant. I wouldn't necessarily advise it, but you certainly could. But you cannot um, combine any of these things with an application to implement. And the reason for that is... Um, we apply uh, historical standards um, when looking at implementation. And so uh, an application to uh, implement, to put in an exhibit or to install a historical marker, it has to come with the finished text, the exhibit text or the marker text, along with two letters of critical review. And so those things have to be done um, for that application. So you'd have to, if you want to use grant funds, you would have to apply for those um, previously. And, and then um, just as importantly, have those previous um, projects closed and, and uh, approved um, with their final reports before you can apply to do the subsequent work that is built on top of those um, foundational things like the interpretive plan, um, the research, uh, or um, the writing. So we're wrapping up here. Um, here's the resources that I used um, in part to put this together. Um, I can, um, I'm happy to share this for anybody that uh, isn't quick on writing down and I, I'm, there's a slide that's coming up, but I'll, I can go back to this um, slide at, at any point too. So um, I make uh, particularly great use out of um, National Association for Interpretation and their standards that they have. And then um, I find that uh, John Viverka's outline for an interpretive plan is one that I um, have referred others to and then I, I make use of myself when I'm brushing up on, on this. So that's um, it for the prepared uh, presentation here, uh, about 30 minutes as I'd hoped for. Um, so I'm gonna switch out of um, the presentation mode here, the slides, and then, um, and then if there are questions, we can, we can address those. So give me a moment to slip out of, uh, out of the, the uh, slides here. Um, I just, I uh, guess I have a question about, um, you guys mentioned that at MNHS you guys can um, do the um, interpretive plan writing. Do you guys also offer services for content, developing the content? Well, I want to be clear, and I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding, like we, um, we're not going to do an interpretive plan writing for you. Like even if you had a grant, you would not be able to hire the Minnesota Historical Society to do that. So I'm not sure if that's what your understanding is if that's what the question is but 
if it's just about can the grant program fund the other pieces, the writing and the research, yes, it absolutely can. So if you develop an interpretive plan using the grant program, or even if you just have an interpretive plan that was um, done outside of the grant program, you can definitely come to us to do the research or the writing um, for it and um, the implementation of it, the publishing or the, the fabrication of the exhibit. Is that the question that you had? Did I answer it? Yeah, yeah. I thought earlier in the presentation you said something that um, MNHS, you guys um, maybe have staff there that do interpretive plan, like write interpretive plans for other organizations. I thought I heard you say that, but I might yeah, have misunderstood that. Uh, uh, yeah, there are firms out there that, um, that uh, provide that service. Um, we have something on our website called the, um, the Preservation Specialist Directory. It's kind of a yellow pages, as it were, of a lot of the people that can do the work that the grant program accomplishes, including interpretive planners. Um, so, but also on there are um, conservators and uh, people that can do um, tuck pointing on a National Register building and, and that type of work. So there are, um, there are a handful of firms in Minnesota that do interpretive plans and planning. And uh, so I would, and they do very good work and uh, have successfully done work um, for, on behalf of uh, grantees. So I would encourage you to go there and definitely if you need some assistance on figuring out like, you know, we don't make recommendations uh, for this, but we can, we can help you sort of figure out a little bit of like um, who's done uh, work on similar types of um, projects in the past. Okay, thank you. And we have a we have a question from Brad here. So what's he's asking? What is the approximate timeline from grant submission to approval of funding? And so the for a small grant, uh, it's going to take about two months for you to to hear uh, if you got the grant, and then it might be another month after that before you get the first check or. For a small grant, the you're going to get the entire check. For a large grant, it's about five month process. So, um, you know, if you're uh, applying to the large round in in May, uh, you know, you're probably going to find out in you know November, let's say, and your start date might be either December first or January first for a large grant if you get it in the in the next round. So Wayne's got the, uh, Wayne Ganaway at uh, Olmstead County is, can a small grant feasibly cover the cost of an interpretive planning process? Um, that's a difficult question to assess. I would say mm, probably not, um, although it kind of, dep it depends on a couple of things. So I would definitely um, begin talking to some interpretive planners that you could find on the preservation specialist directory about what your needs are. And they're really the ones that would help you determine the cost. I would say that we don't very often see an interpretive plan come in for less than $10,000. I've seen them, uh, but most of them are in the $25,000 to $40,000 range. And that's not all of them, but I would say that's just anecdotally most of them. Um, but we have seen organizations come in and do uh, phases of a interpretive plan uh, through us that they might do the audience analysis portion with a small grant and then do the um, the thematic development with an additional small grant after the first one is closed. But you would have to do those sort of sequentially. Um, you wouldn't be able to, for instance, in the same small grant round, apply for uh, different portions of the same interpretive plan, one that's the audience analysis and ones that, that is the thematic development, because that's a sort of a uh, false um, segmenting of it that sort of gets it under the um, under $10,000 so that it doesn't go into the more competitive large round. And also with some of the dollar amounts um, at different thresholds, there's some more financial reporting that's required. So you wouldn't sort of be able to get it under um, $10,000 just to avoid some of the uh, um, financial report and that's required. I don't know, that might've been more, more answered than there was question. <laughs> so what I heard you say, Todd, is that uh, the only, usually the only way a small grant 
uh, could cover the cost of an interpretive plan would be if it was sort of organically broken into at least like two pieces. Yeah. With that said, started. I mean, I have seen, um, I think even in recent rounds, uh, uh, an application for an interpretive plan that was for $10,000. It was for a smaller, a narrowly focused um, plan uh, and, and area of focus. So yeah, it's, it's possible, but I would definitely, I always encourage people to be talking to potential vendors ahead of time um, so that they can get a reasonable idea of what the costs are. Um, as I said earlier in the presentation, you don't have to hire um, before. You don't have to know who you're hiring beforehand. But I find a lot of uh, advantage to knowing that before you apply. It gives you a good number for your budget. Um, you still have to go through the procurement process. Everyone should have a fair opportunity to bid on your project. But I think there's a lot of good reasons to do that before you apply. All right. You know, like one thing I didn't talk a lot about in the presentation, but I'm just sort of scanning through some of the comments here and I'm seeing um, is the idea of, you know, who might want an interpretive plan. And definitely you can do that at the organization level, uh, you know, a county historical society or, or a city or county park or something like that. And I think like, you know, with city and county parks, it's like this interesting thing where they, you know, they might be covering an, a larger sort of area. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at with this is I, I, there's a lot of great opportunity in there to do an interpretive plan for something outside to partner with uh, a neighbor or something like that to do, do a joint interpretive plan. We've seen, um, we have a partnership program, which this would definitely be appropriate for, but you could also just do it through the regular grant program where we've seen, um, different property owners that are telling the same story um that uh that they've come together to do an interpretive plan they, they own different parts of of a, of a resource like a historic district or something like that and i often think about how like a county in southeast minnesota like you know like in some ways like there's this story of southeast minnesota that they kind of want to tell in a broader way and then focus on their their section of it their county borders but uh you know counties that are together in a corner of the state to get together and sort of say like, we want to do an interpretive plan for Southeast Minnesota, you know, as an example or something like that. So there's a lot of great opportunity for that. And, uh, you know, even just like cities and units of government, like an interpretive plan is a great thing that they can use as a way to um, communicate what the needs are of the, of their community. So even if they're, you know, if there's a city water issue or something like, like that coming up to have an interpretive plan for your city, is something that you can do as well so that you can understand like, well, what's a way that we can present and make some changes on these needed things. Well, I think we're running out of questions. I think what I'm going to do is I, I'm, I'll stay on for a while until I see that, you know, everyone has left. Um, but just to encourage everyone to know like that, uh, that there's inf lots of information available on the grants website. Um, so you can just find it at mnhs.org and then go to the preservation tab and you'll be able to find the grants page that way. Um, things to know about for the deadlines, there are quarterly deadlines for the small grant rounds, which are the ones that are $10,000 and less. Uh, next one coming up is on January 10th. Uh, they're always the second Friday of January, April, May, excuse me, <laughs> January, April, July, and October. Uh, and then the large round, which is projects that are more than $10,000, that's just offered once a year. Next year in 2020, the pre-application deadline, the pre-application is required. There's no pre-application with the small ones. The pre-application deadline is in late May, and I'm blanking on the exact dates, but you can find that info on the, on the website. Pre-application is in late May, and then there's a final application where you'll get comments back from content reviewers like me or whoever is assigned uh, your, um, your project, and those are designed to improve it. And so, the, the final applications are due in early July. Todd had mentioned the, the partnership program and the, the deadline for that is January 24th. Um, and of course it's a, it's a whole different program with different uh, requirements, but uh, I do think it's, it's a good way for, you know, something like a joint interpretive plan that could work yeah. very well for a partnership. Yeah, uh, last year, just as an example, the um, Dodge County Historic Society and um, and uh, some, uh, I'm not blanking if it was the city or the county, 
that they together own some different resources for the for a historic district. Um, and uh, so they came together to do an interpretive plan. And, you know, like this is something that can tell each of them how they're going to interact with to, to tell a shared message. And I think it's a great, great thing that they put together.